Hello, this is Stanley Sism. We continue with our study of Pauline Epistles 1, which are the epistles of Romans and Galatians. We are on Galatians chapter 1, verse 14. Paul is talking about his previous life and before he came to Christ. He has discussed his, uh, he has, uh, his background, and then he is also talking about his calling, his mission, and um, then he has, uh, after talking about this con his conversion and calling and mission, then he begins to talk about his initial contacts with the apostles who had been apostles before he was. That's in verses 18 through 24. And then in chapter 20, chapter 2, he will talk about going to Jerusalem and the incident in Antioch. And that will finish with chapter 2, verse 14, which is this section of the book about his background and uh, and um, now he says he had been extremely zealous about persecuting the church and uh, this is reflected this statement here in Galatians is reflected also in Acts 9 chapters well Acts 8 and 9 the chapters of his uh, persecution of the church and then his conversion and Acts 22 and 26, two places where he gives his testimony of how he had been uh, previously a persecutor of the church. Also Philippians 3, where he talks about his background. He had been extremely zealous persecuting the church, and he, his own faultless legalistic righteousness, but until he discovered that everything he thought was in his favor using accounting terms, everything he thought was a credit to him, he suddenly discovered was a debit in his account. And so therefore, he realized that it was all rubbish, it was garbage, it was trash, it was refuse, it was ofa, it was uh, awful ofa. And so um, Paul's presentation of this has followed the forms of oratorical forms of his day. First of all, narrating the facts, which he is doing in this section we've been talking about. And then he, he states after that his contention, which is the, the punch of the book in chapters 2, verse 15 to 21, that justification is by faith in Jesus Christ and by, by grace, God's grace to us and through faith in that grace. Then in chapters 3 and 4, he gives further uh, arguments that supporting that. And in chapter 5, verse 1 through in chapter 6, verse 10, he gives ethical consequences of that. And then, of course, the closing of the book. Now, um, he, is, he has been persecuting the, the believers in the church. And but he had been very zealous of this, and the the church, the, the the persecution of the church continued after Paul, of course, and it can continued until the whole thing came crashing down around them in sixty six to seventy A D, which Jesus had said was going to happen. He said that if because they did not recognize when their Messiah came, therefore not one stone would be left upon another. And when the Romans came, that was literally fulfilled. The Romans seeking to get the gold that had melted on the fire, melted down the walls of the, of the temple, and fallen the cracks between the st st stones. They wedged the stones out and sent them crashing to the pavement below to get the gold. And as a result, quite literally, not on that top of that surface, not one stone was left upon another, and the temple was completely torn down. And uh, Paul talking about his ancestral traditions. After the Babylonian captivity, Jewish rabbis who were interpreting and applying Moses' law began compiling rules and regulations about people's daily life. These rules were transmitted orally, and in Jesus' day they were still in oral form. And they were later put in written form at post post Jesus time on earth, but at Jesus' day they were still in oral form, and they are referred to in Matthew chapter fifteen verse two, and Mark seven and Colossians two. But these uh, around two hundred and eighty, these were written into the Mishnah. But Jesus contrasted this oral tradition, which he disparaged, 
with Moses' written law, which he said would not fail until it was fulfilled. So now Paul launches into his autobiographical statement, and he says, uh, uh, He's, 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 God says, God set me apart, verse 15. God set me apart from birth. So before I was born, God set me apart. Now, Isaiah 49 and Jeremiah chapter, uh, chapter 1 both talk about that God had set the prophets apart from before birth. And of course, this is one of, along with Psalm 139, this is a very strong argument against abortion because we know that before we are born God has already planned good things for us to do Ephesians chapter 2 says also uh, that God has planned God has planned good things for us to do and has uh, planned, planned our salvation and so um, uh, God called me now God calls everybody for his purpose we talked about this in chapter uh, early in chapter one, the introduction to the book. Uh, at the, sorry, the, the the salutation of the book at the beginning, first few verses, and God called Paul in Acts chapter nine, and He told Paul uh, that you will be my chosen instrument to um, to uh, speak the message to the Gentiles. This, of course, is by God's grace, Karis again, and so. Paul is told that he is to can preach to the Gentiles. Now this word, Gentiles, this harks back to Paul's call in Acts 9, and he Paul re refers back to this also in Romans uh, several times, and he'll refer to it here in Galatians again in chapter 2, and he'll refer to it in Colossians 1. But the Gentiles literally means the nations, the peoples, and the, the Jews mean by this the, the foreigners, the non-Jewish worlds, um, and so in since that time, in that time, uh, most nations of the world worship idols. So this same word meant pagans, idol worshippers, because the non-Jewish world were pagans; they were, I, were idol worshippers. So he says, "I did not learn this from any man." The literal term is flesh and blood. It's also used in the New Testament, like flesh and blood, to imply human weakness or ignorance. I did not learn this. Uh, Matthew 16, Jesus says to Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. So human weakness did not tell you this, but my Father in heaven told you this. And now Paul is saying the same thing. He says, I did not learn this from flesh and blood. I learned this from weakness. I learned this from God himself. And the same expression is in 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter, and Ephesians 6, the spiritual warfare passage. And so I did another way to look at it is in 1 Corinthians 15, is it's not a human authority. So, so all of this is, uh, he's talking about his own, coming, uh, receiving his knowledge directly from God. Peter did that, so did Paul. And I did not immediately consult anyone, Paul, Peter says, and, and uh, Paul says, and that refers back to Acts 9, but God had chosen to reveal his son to me. And that is, of course, referred to in Acts 9 and, uh, and uh, these other chapters which we have mentioned. Now, Paul then says that he went to, to some other places, and let's look at what these places mean. So verse 17, uh, in terms of a geography lesson, Paul goes from, uh, from to Arabia, which, what does they mean by that? Uh, what does he mean by that? This Nabataean kingdom in Transjordan, which stretches from Damascus east and south, uh, down to the Suez, um, and so Damascus is Syria's ancient capital, and Syria is called Aram in the Old Testament, and the uh, this Nabataean kingdom eventually the capital during Roman time uh, before Roman times had come to be Petra. Uh, Petra, of course, means rock in Greek, and so boulder. So then 
this it is a very uh, out of the way place carved into the rock a good place for retreat from foreign armies so um, Damascus was easily conquered but Petra was far more remote and so um, Paul had come to faith in Jesus Christ on the road from Jerusalem to Damascus then after the conversion experience he went to Arabia and he does not mention the exact place but into these eastern deserts and southern deserts then eventually came back to Damascus and of course this story is also in Acts 9 then he says in verse 18 after three years now the way the time is is calculated in these uh, cultures is we mean in the third year so many times today even in these even in, in asia when you ask somebody their age and if they say 15 they mean they are in their 15th year they are that doesn't whereas in america and the west we when we say we are 15 we mean we have completed 15 years so when we look at times time that has been mentioned in the biblical era we must remember uh, that we are in the, the the third year so that's two years more than two years uh, have gone by from the time of what from the time of his departure into Arabia or uh, uh, or it, he, he went to Jerusalem or perhaps uh, uh, how f f after three years from what from the time of his um, a conversion from the time of, um, of uh, did he go to Arabia and then up to Damascus and then to Jerusalem see how what's going on during this sweet thing the text does not say that he spent the whole three years in Arabia it's just uh, so uh, Galatians says that he went to Jerusalem here to be with uh, uh, he went to be with Peter uh, he went for 15 days. Now we think in terms of weeks. And the Jewish people knew about weeks, of course, seven days. So uh, six days you work, seven days you rest. But they often scheduled their life around moon phases. And this had been going on a long time. If you go you go back to David's time and, and they have these new moon festivals that they have, they gather. And uh, this has been something which has been done very, very many times. If you go to Jane Austen's books, you will notice that they have their fellowship meetings when different churches gather together at the time of the full moon. Well, why is that? Because this is a pre-electricity era, and when there's full moon, you can see when you uh, when it's your. Uh, when it's dark moon and you are going to your local church and you know the pathway you can walk there in the dark you've done it so many times but uh, when you're going to a strange place and all the congregations of a particular area are meeting at another building and people going there are unfamiliar with the place if you have it uh, at full moon time uh, people can walk there and in, in by the moonlight even the night in the in an in in unfamiliar road now you will notice from Solomon's time, uh, you know, so that there was the, the the priests had these rotations, the twenty four cycles of priests, twelve months of the year, and two moon phases in each uh, in each month, and so um, they had these twenty four groups of uh, of priests who would serve in the temple. So it was to, to say that he worked for fifteen month, uh, fifteen days. That means from either full moon to new moon, or from new moon to full moon. It's easy to measure time that way. And uh, Jews many times did this. Uh, so the uh, Paul observed the Jewish calendar planned to be at Jerusalem at Pentecost. So this this was all very familiar to all of them. Paul wants to talk to Peter even though Paul has his call from God and not from anybody else, and he already has that call before he talks to Peter or anybody else in Jerusalem. But he, Peter does have something that Paul doesn't have. Peter has spent three years in Jesus' presence uh, in ministry. Jesus has been with uh, Peter face to face, day after day, uh, for, for years. And so um, Peter has that.
and Paul can learn a lot about Jesus from Peter. So, he, but when Paul talks about meeting him, he calls him Cephas. Now, Cephas is the Hebrew, Petros is the Greek, and they both mean rock. Why is Paul using Peter's Hebrew name, Cephas, here? Because Paul's big issue here, big point he's trying to make, is that uh, Peter is the apostle to the Jews, and he, Paul, is apostle to the Gentiles. So he, he uses, he deliberately uses the Hebrew name, he's apostle to the Jews. And um, so then in verse 19, Paul uh, says that he also met with James, the Lord's brother. Now, <clears throat> um, in Acts chapter 12, it mentions that uh, James, who is John's brother, was killed by Herod. And the Jews liked that so much that that's when uh, uh, Herod was good at planning to kill uh, Peter as well. But then God rescued Peter from the from the prison. So um, <clears throat> this James <clears throat> is the Lord's brother, and uh, and he's mentioned also in Matthew 13, verse 55, that's an introduction to him there, and Mark 6, and then he comes into prominence in, uh, in the book of Acts, uh, uh, 15, Acts 15, especially at the Jerusalem conference. He became a leader of the Jerusalem churches after Peter, who had been the leader, started traveling away from Jerusalem. And so, uh, and the story goes that after James was uh, killed, uh, was uh, martyred in 62 AD, that after that, another of Jesus' brothers, Simeon, became the leader of the Jerusalem church. So these people, who are these? Uh, some have said that James and all that were sons of Joseph by a previous marriage, Epiphanes said. Jerome said they were cousins. And Helvetus said they were sons of Joseph and Mary, younger half-brothers of Jesus. Mark 6 names four of these brothers and also mentions sisters. Since that scripture in, it does not mention Joseph, and doesn't, nor does any scripture mention Joseph, after Jesus' trip to Jerusalem at age 12, it's quite possible that Joseph died before Jesus' public ministry began. Think of it another way as well. Jesus is called, when he starts his public ministry, one text says that the crowd said, is not this the carpenter's son? And another verse says, is not this the carpenter? Well, he's both. He's the carpenter's son, as they thought. And then, but Joseph died, and Jesus, as eldest son of the child of the family, has taken over the carpenter shop. So he becomes the carpenter, uh, the one responsible, uh, taking care of the family. But then, of course, uh, he have, they have other sons coming up and uh, and into adulthood, and so he hits the road at when he's about thirty years of age. So. James saw Jesus after the resurrection, but he wasn't an apostle. Notice, they had to be witnesses of the resurrection, but they also, apostles also were supposed to have been with us from the very beginning. And so that meant they were originally supposed to be some of those, they may not have been of the 12, but they were of the 70. They were people who had been there all the way through to receive teaching from Jesus Christ. And James was never one of those because the brothers of Jesus came to the conversion after the resurrection. Let me ask, why would they not come? Remember how Jesus uh, said that the prophet is not without honor, save in his own, in his own uh, place, among his own people, among his own family. That, that this is this is the this is not surprising because <clears throat> when somebody grows up among people that they've seen him as a baby or seen him or her as a small child as a baby and then suddenly it's hard sometimes for them to realize that a person that they have wiped his bottom when, uh, when, uh, as a baby that suddenly this person they who they have seen cry and be frail and uh, is now suddenly a man of God and sometimes it's hard for them especially if the time comes for instruction, even rebuke, spiritual rebuke, 
They don't want to take that. Their answer is, don't tell me what to do. I smacked your bottom when you were a kid. I, 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 uh, I cleaned your diapers, you know, don't tell me what to do. So, so there, is, there is a time when often people don't, uh, don't accept a spiritual leadership from someone who is very close to them. That's why we often say in ministry that the person should go away and work among somebody else and, uh, and uh, prove their mettle in that sense, in that unfamiliar environment. Now, <clears throat> James has come to the Lord only after uh, after the resurrection and the consequence of that is that he's not one of the apostles and he led the Jerusalem elders after Peter hit the road and uh, but he's not an apostle verse 20 Paul says I assure you before God no lie and he's asserting his he has to assert his truthfulness and this is to churches that he has founded in Galatia. And uh, to strangers in Rome, he says, God is my witness, Romans chapter 1. And that phrase is typical in the Bible. It's in Job 16, it's in Jeremiah 42, and Paul uses it in a few other places. And to the Romans, he says, Romans 9, 1, I'm not lying. And uh, here he's saying the same thing. It's, it's not a lie. And... Uh, it hurts to say this to someone that you know and love and to whom you've never lied. Uh, but you have to say it because someone else has poisoned their mind and you have to assure. So then, verse 21, Paul says, I then went. So now he's reaching near the end of his testimony time about Acts chapter 9, getting near the end of that account. I then left that place. There was uh, opposition to Paul in Jerusalem as there had been in Damascus and as there would be again uh, because they were incensed by the fact that the person who had been uh, jailing and killing Christians was now suddenly preaching the gospel that he had been trying to disprove and crush before. Verse uh, 21, he says, I went to Syria and Cilicia. Now, those are provinces. Specifically, he went to Cilicia, the, the chief city is Tarsus. That's his hometown. So after meeting Paul, at, uh, after meeting Peter at Jerusalem, he goes back home to Tarsus. And we know from the book of Acts that it's that Barnabas who went to see the church in Antioch. Antioch is the capital of Syria. So Barnabas went from Antioch to Tarsus to get Paul to come to help him to teach all these new people in Antioch. So, so when Paul says here, I went to Syria and Cilicia, he means uh, I went to, specifically he's went to Tarsus and Antioch. And so he's talking about his history and how he came to the Lord, then he went into Arabia, he came back to Jerusalem, and um, then he's gone back home, and he, then he's been called to, to Antioch. So, um, you can see on Syria, you can see references in Acts 15, verses 23 to 41. And uh, so, verse 22, um, he then went, to, he says, the churches of Judea had, did not know him by face. They, had, they did not recognize him. They, they, did not know, they had never seen him. But the story went around that... Uh, that he is the person who had been persecuting the church was now suddenly uh, su supporting the message that he had opposed previously. And he was now in Christ Jesus. This expression is in Romans 16 over and over again when Paul talks about his companion ministers who are in Christ Jesus with him. And so it's a great joy that, the, that uh, he is now so serving the Lord and, and preaching the gospel. That was verse 23. And um, people who hadn't seen him had now accepted him, but the Galatians who knew him well and who he had won to the Lord uh, were, were deserting him. That's the, that's the part that hurts him and uh, uh, grieves him. So, verse 24, he says that now... Uh, 
he, he said they praise God because, and that should be the reaction to all, when we see all the very, very many testimonies that of what God has done in people's lives. And so uh, praising God over, or the triumph of the victory of Jesus Christ in people's lives and transforming their lives, and to, to, that they praise God for what, the, what God had done in his life, which is exactly the way the reaction should be. So that's where we are so far at the end of chapter one. God bless you.